Well, thank you, first of all, for asking me um, to be here. It is a real privilege always to share um, you know, the knowledge that I have and the experience that I have with everyone. So um, back in 2000, which is 23 years ago, my husband was the pastor of the Presbyterian Church in Cranford. And he asked me, because um, I was working with a hospice at the time, and I had gone for a certification as a pastoral bereavement counselor. And he asked me to please write a program to help people to um, journey through grief. He, we, at the time we had a 900 member congregation and he said, I just can't do it all myself. And he was the type of pastor that would, you know, come in your kitchen and have a cup of coffee with you after a loss or have dinner with you. And um, so as a dutiful pastor's wife, I sat down and um, developed with God leading me um, a seminar. So it's called a seminar. It's seven weeks, and um, we we have one three times a year. And what we basically do is to help people journey through grief. And I'll explain that more in a minute. So we started in October of 2000 at the First Presbyterian Church in Cranford. And my husband then went to Pittsburgh Theological Seminary for a um, pastor's retreat. And he jogged every day of his life. Um, he just had turned 51. Back then I was 49 years old. And um, unfortunately he passed away suddenly of a heart attack while jogging um, in Pittsburgh. So here I found myself, I was living in a church manse. I was homeless. Um, my husband just died suddenly. I had three children that I had to try and work with and see how we were going to go on. Um, I also had to find a new job. So I basically had to find a whole new identity. And so I looked at what I had learned and I thought, well, you know, I'm walking the walk, I'm talking the talk. My parents had passed away. I had had that experience. And several of my family members, because being a nurse, you know, who are you going to ask to take care of your family members at the end of their life? Patty. So I've taken care of probably 17 to 18 of my family members um, in the last month or so of their life which I consider a privilege. But anyway, let's backtrack to October of 2000. So um, another participant who was leading one of the sessions with me, Virginia Waters, she's a PhD psychologist. She and I decided that we would go on with the seminars and we would lead them as Bruce had had a vision for, um, because there was a purpose for it. We didn't know what it was going to be, but there was a purpose for it. So um, when COVID came along, we went to Zoom. And do you know what happened? We reached people all over the United States. We have reached people in other countries. We've had people from Hawaii, Finland, um, Egypt, all, all over the place come and join us. And if a family is grieving together the loss of a member, then the whole family can join us because they can join from wherever they are. So if you would have asked my husband, could you ever see being on you know, a screen like you know, the Brady Bunch and all these people all over the world, he would have had no idea what you were talking about. All he did was ask me to develop a seminar. So we've gone along with um, all of the changes. Um, my partner who um, helped me, uh, we, we co-led all the sessions, Dr. Virginia Waters, unfortunately passed away this last January. So it has been um, a big change for me in leading the seminars by myself. But I have wonderful facilitators that help me and um, we did just fine. And we felt Virginia's presence with us and she always will be with us as a part of the program. Um, and we do dedicate the program 
to Virginia in honor of Virginia and in memory of my husband. We always say that. Um, so, you know, when I look at it, um, why don't we talk about grief more? Maybe circles of people that you're in do. But, you know, um, as a nurse, I've been up to Lantern Hill. I've been in a lot of different facilities. And people just say, you know, when somebody dies, they just die and nobody wants to talk about it. And this bothers some people. Other people, they just want to shy away from the topic because it might get too personal. So tonight, I thought what we would do is just look at some of the basics of grief that um, I teach in the first uh, week um, that, we, that we meet. Um, and I want to tell you a little bit about the format. When we meet on Zoom, I usually present interactively for about 40, 45 minutes on the topic for the night. And then we break into small groups of like loss. And this is as homogenous as we can get it. My facilitators that are intake facilitators um, have everyone in the group with the same type of loss. And the facilitator that leads the group has been trained by me and they have had the same type of loss, but they're further down the line. And I have been very blessed with 13 facilitators that give graciously of their time on Sunday nights to um, help leave this program. I could never do it without them. Um, so I want to just say a, a great thank you to them. Um, we meet for seven consecutive Sunday nights from 6.30 till eight o'clock. And then um, we take a break until the next seminar. Some people might come for three seminars during the year because one of the facts that we know about grief is at the time of loss, the adrenaline and cortisol are very high in our body. And this is scientifically proven. Um, and it drops down at three month intervals. And this might take a year, might take a year and a half, might take two years for some people. And guess what creeps in? Well, this adrenaline and cortisol that hold us up, guess what creeps in when that comes down? Reality. So every three months, a little more reality seeps in. And, you know, that's the way that our bodies were made so that we could handle it because we can't handle it all at once. So it's a process within our body that we learn to um, recognize. And we say, and I personally think that it gives us some control when we have some education about what is happening to us. If we can separate ourselves a little bit and look at it and say, you know what? That's that adrenaline. That's why I can't concentrate. That's why I can't read a book. Um, that's why I can't remember anything. I can't remember where I put the car keys. My head feels all messed up. Um, you can blame it on the adrenaline and the cortisol. But then you can also say to yourself, I know that it's not always gonna be this way, that they're going to drop down. And as the reality seeps in, I've learned tools in Patty's seminar to take care of myself so that I can cope with the reality of the loss as it comes through. Um, so I think that uh, we need to look at all of the aspects of grief when we're learning about it. So in the seven weeks, the first night it's called, What is Grief? The second week is the five tasks of grief, not to be confused with the five stages of grief. The five tasks of grief are different. Um, week three is taking good care of yourself, which that's how we basically get through um, the loss of a loved one. And week four is called changes, choices, and challenges, which is a very, very powerful week. And about week four, the people in the seminar start to become cohesive within the group. And, you know, we have really, really good discussions in the small group to help one another. Um, week five is reconnecting spiritually, because no matter what your faith, when you have a loss, there are going to be questions about where is my loved one? Where am I going someday? The spiritual journey also comes into question. 
Um, week six is holidays, special anniversaries, and how do we make it through those special times and difficult times. And then week seven, we do cherishable memories, which is talking about um, building memories in your loved one's name to help their life to have the meaning go on and to help other people. And that's a real part of the healing process. So those are the seven weeks that, um, that we do cover. So tonight I would like to talk um, a little bit about grief and what is this thing called grief. So I've told you about what do we know about it. I told you about the adrenaline and the cortisol. And by the way, I give a test at the end of this. So um, if you want to take notes, uh, I'll be giving you a grade. Just kidding. Anyway, um, so first of all, what is our workable definition of grief? And the person that I trained under, Dr. Patrick Del Zappo, basically said that grief is the protest, and that's a very active verb, of the protest of the body and the mind and the spirit against the loss of someone or something that had meaning to you. So I'll repeat that again. The definition of grief is the protest of the body and the mind and the spirit against the loss of someone or something that had meaning to you. So inside of us, we have this protest going on. We have this adrenaline high and people will often call and they'll say, I think I'm going crazy. I don't know what I'm feeling. And then we start to talk and begin to learn about their story. Um, grieving is normal. It's a normal process. It is acceptable and it is healthy. It is highly individualized. No two people grieve the same. So guess what that sort of stirs up? In families, it can be a little bit of controversy. With friends, it can be a little controversy because well, I'm not grieving that way. Why are you grieving that way? I'm crying. Why aren't you crying? You know, all of that type of thing. Um, grieving um, has no time limit. A lot of people are like, when will this be over? Well, we don't get over grief. We learn how to work with it. We learn how to accept it. And it's always going to be a part of our life. We learn to cope with it in healthy ways. Um, there's no right or wrong way to grieve. Some people go, really? I thought, I thought this book said I was supposed to do one, two, three, and four, and five, and boom, it'd be done. And there we go. Well, if you have wasted your money on those books, just go return them. I hope you didn't write in them. Um, because there's no right or wrong way to grieve. It takes time. Everybody is different. And I think that that's what our program really um, realizes with people. And it's such a relief to them to know that they don't have to do something, that they don't have to be in some stage or be experiencing something. They can just be where they are and who they are. Um, <clears throat> the physiological reactions are real. Some people will feel shaky. Some people will feel like their knees are like jelly. Some people will feel things in their stomach, um, hard to breathe, all sorts of physiological reactions, and they are real, and they should be paid attention to. And I always say the best person to tell is your doctor, because your doctor does not live in your bedroom. Your doctor does not live in your house. They don't know that something is going on within you unless you let them know. And it's not abnormal to have these, but sometimes we can use some help from a medical professional. Um, dreams about our loved ones are very common. And we talk about that within the group. Um, also the feelings of guilt. If only I had, and we work with that in week two with a very special exercise, which all of the exercises and tools that we teach in the seminar can be used all the way, all the way through life. They're lifelong skills. 
and will be and will be used as things pop up. Um, grief provides us an opportunity for growth. Now, this one I taught. You have to remember, I was teaching this in January after my husband passed away in October. Do you think I really wanted to say, grief is an opportunity for growth? No, I don't want to say that. You know, to me, my life was just fine. All I wanted to say was, give me my old life back. I want my old life back. So that's what I said to the people. I said, look, you know, I am a griever. And right now I can tell you this, but I don't feel this. I want my old life back. And they're all like, yeah, we want our old life back. You know, we were, we were all protesting together. Um, and that's part of the beauty of the seminar is that even though no, a lot of people do not know each other when we come on, we have one thing in common. You don't know until you know. That's the one thing we have in common. Okay, so we have um, another little saying, and that is, the pain will ease in time. True or false? If you think it's true, put your hand up. False. Okay, the pain will ease as the grief work is done. And you may say to me, what in the world is grief work? That's what I teach. By the way, there's no charge for this program. When I was born, and I was a soul up in heaven. God said, who wants to come down on earth, work for nothing, get paid very little at any job that you do, and most of your work will be volunteer that you do. And I said, that's me, I'll go. So there's nothing we don't charge for this. This is a pleasure to be able to describe, you know, what really is real. We are not a DVD you know, plug in some DVD and have somebody tell me how I'm supposed to feel. That, that's not a grief program to me. We are real life people that are walking the journey and, you know, are here to help everyone. Um, lots of people need to set up a new support system. Where did the people go that were our friends? And now all of a sudden, like all of a sudden at 49, I was a widow. Well, guess how much older my friends were than me? Quite a bit older. And now that I'm older, they're even older. <laughs> so, you know, you have to, um, you know, learn where you fit in. You need to find where is your new normal. And that's a lot of what we talk about um, within the program. Okay, I'm going to go over to my next page. Um, <clears throat> So I think that understanding the grieving process and learning the coping tools for the journey um, enable us to ride the waves of grief. So the waves of grief go like this. And one day we're up here and we're like, woohoo, I can do anything. I feel great. The sun's out today. And the next day we're like, what happened? And we're crying. And then our family calls and they're like, you're crying again? And you're like, yeah, I'm crying. These are called the waves of grief. And they go up and they go down. They go up and they go down. And the way that we survive them is by riding a surfboard. And the name of the surfboard is take good care of yourself. And I'm not talking about a shower. I'm not talking about a massage. I'm talking about self-care on steroids things you never thought of to help you with comfort. We're looking for comfort. We need touch. We need love. Every human being needs love. So we learn how to love and care for ourselves. And we spend a whole night on it. We could spend a whole year on it. Um, in between each of the Sunday nights, I also email, which Carla can tell you, um, support. So I'm always emailing thoughts and, and anything I can find to help support everyone in their self-care. Also, the only rite of passage through grief is you can't go over it. You can't go under it. You can't go around it. You have to go through it. Because unless you go through it, 
You may think that you tricked it, but you didn't because it'll come back around sometime later and bite you, you know where. So it's better to deal with it in the beginning and not run away from it because it hurts. So we learn what to do when we go to the point of the pain. We learn to name it, to allow ourselves to feel it, to journal about it. We're really, really big into journaling and to let ourselves be there and then to move on to the present moment. We give ourselves a certain time and then we, we do training in this of how to breathe and then get into the present moment. Another big thing I do want to tell you, if you only remember one thing, during grief and during life, we should not judge ourselves, especially during grief. We do not need to be judging ourselves or others um, in what they say or how they feel. And I'm not going to go over the five stages of Dr. Kubler-Ross because you probably already know them. But for acceptance, we like to say, we don't need to like it. And it comes in different phases. And if someone asks you five million times a day, how are you? How are you? How are you? All you need to say is, I am where I need to be. And they will not ask you any more questions because they will not know what you just said. So it works like magic. You say, I am where I need to be. That's it. So if anybody's been through our program, you will hear them say that. Um, <clears throat> so I'm going to go through a couple things that um, would be are helpful in working with people and not helpful. And I see some of you nodding your heads with me. And you know what? That's like you silently saying amen. You know, when, I, when I'm doing this in person, I'm bouncing and jumping all over the place. And I encourage people to, you know, say amen or go sister or yes. Yeah, so I need, you know, some feedback. That's, that's how I present. Um, things that we, I think most people who have had a loss find bothersome. Again, not everybody right? Because we don't all grieve in the same way, are babblers. And that's people that talk about anything and everything except your loss when you're with them, because they're not comfortable with it. Um, that's ignoring the elephant in the room. It really is very helpful to me, even to this day, to say, Oh, you know, I remember when Bruce married our daughter. That's my husband. Um, remember all the fun that we had? Or, oh, I remember when we did this. That is very helpful. That brings their memory alive and is very helpful. Advice givers. Like the second week after the loss of a spouse. Oh, are you going to start dating again? Are you kidding me? You know. I had a little Italian guy in the front row when I did when we were in person. And he, I said, what would you do if somebody said that to you? And he said, I'd smack him right in the face. <laughs> so we, we get real. Um, and, you know, oh, it takes time to get over it. You know what? Keep your advice to yourself. Sometimes people say advice givers because they don't know what else to say. And then there's the pseudo empathizers. And they say, I know just how you feel. Really? You know how it felt to lose my sister, who was my best friend after my husband died, six weeks after he died, and then my other sister. You really know how that feels? That does not help me. Okay? Something like, um, I don't know how you feel, but I'm here with you. Okay? That, that is, is something that is, I think, more helpful. There's also um, the lesson learners. Everything happens for a reason. Now, some people find this comforting in their grief. Everything happens for a reason. Well, I couldn't figure out any good reason why my husband died that day jogging and not later or something. So that never made, quite made sense to me. And what I talk about in week five, which comes from Pittsburgh Theological Seminary, is called the chaos theory. It's very um, close to why bad things happen to good people. 
And so that's what I taught I teach about on week five. Um, or you know, life is short. You think I don't know that? Um also, um, let me see. If you ignore a friend and decide to lock them off your friend list, just remember how that might feel down the line. Try to include people the best that you can. It's a very loving thing to do. Take your cues from the bereaved person. If someone's sitting there quietly, go sit down beside them. Sometimes holding someone's hand, just being quiet. Um, also, grieving people need to tell their story so that it becomes a reality to them. And I will have people in the seminar say, I don't have anybody to talk to anymore. My story's worn out. So I invite them to call me and I say, you can call me anytime. I will listen to your story over and over and over again because that's what people need. And take them out to dinner and let them talk and just listen. Um, I think also it's very helpful to acknowledge the deceased person um, to say, not be afraid to use their name. Also, if you can remember when someone's birthday is, who is grieving or a special day, it's nice to maybe send some flowers or a card. I'm thinking of you at this special time. That really means a lot when somebody really, you know, goes out of their way to remember you. Um, and then I found the most helpful thing for myself was that we had a church member who came up to me and he said, Patty, I'll get rid of your yard waste for the rest of my life as long as I live in Cranford. Because he could not see me hauling all these limbs and everything to the conservation center. And you know what? John still does that for me. All I have to do is text him. I have my people. I have my staff. These are people that hung in with me for the long run. My vitamin lady gives me vitamins for free to this day. Mean what you say if you're going to give an offer, okay? Um, those, those really go a very, very long way. And then you can turn around and do it for someone else. And that is what this is all about, folks. It's learning how to love each other and how to be there for one another. And one more. Please meet us where we are and don't have expectations. Please do not compare one grief with another. People, I mean, they don't mean to be mean, but they say, oh, you're so lucky that your husband died suddenly and didn't have to suffer. Well, no, thank you. That doesn't really help me. Um, think before you say anything. All we really can say is, I'm sorry for your loss. Let me know how I can be of help. I'm really sorry for your loss. And give a big hug. Um, grief support takes work, stamina, and commitment. Be present. Be humble. Be patient. Observe. Reflect. Allow silence. Don't judge accept and listen. So our next seminar coming up is April 16th and I will send the press release to Liz and then she can forward it to you and anyone interested can call and um, register and come and join us and we would love to have you. Oh, thank you. Um... Thank you so much. I'm going to just remove that spotlight and see if we can open up the room a little bit. Um, there are a couple of questions now. You somebody was asking about the five tasks of grief, but that's something that you go over. Um, oh, actually, I absolutely knew someone was going to ask me about that. Mm -hmm. So I actually have my paper right here. Okay. And I will just tell them to you. Okay. Um, we do have handouts because we used to meet in person. Now it all comes online. 
Um, the, the first grief task is accepting the reality of the loss. And this takes time and eventually the emotional, which I go back here, base in my head, um, um, it takes time for the emotional to catch up to the intellectual. Intellectually, we know that the loss has happened. We have to do our grief work for the emotional to catch up to the intellectual. And that's a big part of the healing process. Mm -hmm. um, we have to acknowledge what has changed, what has not changed. Well, you've got to get out of your living room. You've got to get off the couch. Um, you have to get out into the world to begin to experience what has changed. Grief task two is going to the point of pain, which I already um, talked about. Um, grief task three is adjusting to the environment without your loved one and making allowances for what you have lost. And that demands new beginnings. For instance, I have a man who mows my lawn. Okay, it's resources. I have a handyman. I have um, friends who help me with this, help me with that. My kids are amazed that the people that come to my back door that are my staff, I just say, oh, come on in, meet my family. This is my staff. Um, we need to find resources to help us to adjust to our loss. Now, every person that is no longer here had a certain role within our life. Like my mother was the disseminator of information. So, you know, who's going to do that? Um, my mother kept us all together with dates. Well, now I'm the, the matriarch of our family. So I do that. I'm always, you know, texting dates and all of that type of thing. Maybe somebody, um, for a lot of people, they never cooked before. And I tell them that if you, and this is generally I find with men, and by the way, men grieve differently than women. That's another one of our topics. Um, but I say, if you pick the same diner, like say the Westfield diner, and you go there for breakfast and you sit in the same booth and you get the same waitress, guess what? Within a few weeks, you aren't even gonna have to tell her what you want. She knows how you drink your coffee. She knows everything about you. And that is so comforting to some people, um, you know, to, to have that present in their lives. So we need to find ways to um, fill these gaps that of all of these um, roles that people have for us. My sister was a psychologist and I was very, very close to her. I've lost, two of my sisters are in heaven. I never say I lost them because I didn't lose them. I know where they are. So I just say <laughs> that they passed over. I did not lose them. Um, but I have found people with similar personalities that I can talk to and it's very helpful. I like I like to talk to somebody about the news. So mm -hmm. I picked a gal that knows all about the news and I talk with her about the news. She's not my sister, but she helps to fulfill that role. Mm -hmm. um, and then the fifth one, I'm sorry, the fourth grief task is where we really, really wanna end up. And that's gaining emotional release from the attachment and reinvesting in life. And that's something that's going to come within time. Um, you go through a life review. It's very normal to like have a video camera and you start with this relationship from the beginning to the end, beginning to the end. It goes and it goes and it goes. That's very normal. Welcome it. And you learn to say, oh, hi, life review. Is it you again? All right. Mm -hmm. And then eventually it will stop. But the more we know to talk to grief and talk to our body, it gives us some control so that we don't feel that it has control of us. And believe it or not, a spiritual relationship is possible with your loved ones. And you might say, oh, doesn't that prolong letting go? Well, I don't believe in letting go. I believe that we travel along with grief. Grief is a journey. That person's always going to be a part of us. Where are we going to let them go to? <laughs> they live in our hearts. Um, so we learn in doing random acts of kindness for others. It is in giving that we receive. 
We learned once we get that energy back from that protest, we learn how to give to others to receive and to find purpose in suffering. Mm. And the grief task five is restructuring our faith um, after a loss. And so those are the five tasks. They're like the five stages in that they don't go, oh, I'm done with one, check it off. I'm done with two, check it off. They're gonna come all during the journey, all jumbled up, just like the five stages of grief. The big thing that's important is that you say, oh, I know you, you've been around before. And then you remember the tools that we taught you to work with it. And then that helps the healing process. Does that make sense? Mm-hmm. Yes, yes. And um, I, I will say that several folks um, from our community did participate in your um, in your group. I know a couple of them might be on the call, but what is the age range of folks participants in your seminars usually? Well, when we met in person and on, like I have to say with Zoom, the youngest has been eight Mm -hmm. and the oldest has been 99. I don't think we've had any octogarians, Um, but it was interesting when we met in person, the mother had asked if she could bring her son. And I said, sure. She said, he'll just play with Legos in the back. Every single question I asked he answered. Mm. He got so much out of that seminar. But again, it depends. With children, I usually refer them to, we have a program, Imagine, in Westfield. And I usually do refer them there. But if if people ask, you know, if they can um, come, absolutely. And teenagers, we've had teenagers. We have a great group of people in their 20s. I would say every single um, age range mm. is present. Okay. And we look at that in grouping in the small groups too, because people relate, you know, with a certain loss, they're going to relate to different things because of their age. And so it brings them more together. Is it because of the age? And do you find that the type of loss affects the grief, whether it was long and protracted or sudden or you know well, that that is all week one which i oh, did not okay. go through or yeah, okay be here. Yeah. but <laughs> no, um, the mourning process is determined by the relationship that you had with the person okay. so part of what we talk about on week one is who is the bereaved and we go down exactly what you said for each and every person they have to journal about this themselves you know what were the surroundings who are you what's your personality um all of that depends okay very specifically so one of um that 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 helps actually it's really um important to note um uh, one of the questions that was asked um if you wouldn't mind answering was what was most surprising to you after um about the grief process after Bruce's death? Mm. Well, you know, it's interesting because my husband's death mimicked my husband's death, uh, my father's death. Um, So I was 20 when my father passed away of the same thing. He wasn't jogging, he was driving, Um, but he also had a heart attack. I would say, Um, The age that I was, because we go through this too, it depends on what age you are um, with the grieving process, how it affects you as well. I would say that I've been married 27 years and I didn't know what it was like to live without my spouse. Mm -hmm. And we were so connected at the hip as a pastoral couple that I really had to find out who in the world I was. I mean, who wants to hang out with the pastor's wife? You know, you can't swear in front of her. You can't gossip in front of her. I really had no friends. I had no girlfriends. Mm. And so I was like, oh boy, what do I do? And these women started asking me out and I felt so awkward. But I learned that I had to push through it and that I needed to say yes and that eventually it would it would be okay. Mm, that's helpful. And did, did you find that you had to restructure your sense of faith? Like 
Well, I got, I was pretty angry with God. Now I could not yell in the house because my dog had a very sensitive stomach and then she would end up having diarrhea and we were at the vet and the whole bit. So I went into my car, but remember the car was not on. Okay. Um, so I went in the, my car in the driveway and I just pounded on the steam steering wheel and I screamed and I yelled and my protest, I was very angry. Um, and then I would say, because I was raised in the faith, and again, this is something that we talk about week five, you know, it's like raise a child up and when he is old, he will not depart from it. Um, and so my faith came back to me and is stronger than ever because mm -hmm. I just have to tell you one real quick story. Um, Carla's already heard this, but um, I had to find a new place to live. And so I was going around looking at houses with my realtor. I was not eating. I was a mess. And I would say, that's not my house. I don't want to live there. That's not my house. I don't want to live there. So then finally, she brought us to this one house. So they're going to have an open house on Sunday. So my youngest son was 20 or 19. And he was taking me around. And I walked in this house. And I said, oh, my gosh, daddy and I were in here he baptized a little girl. And then we came back here for the party. He was in the bathroom. He was in the kitchen. Adam said, that's it. She's <laughs> buying this house. I said, Adam, I don't have any money. I, I can't afford this house. Well, by midnight, I own the house. The amount of the mortgage was down to exactly what my husband's pension amount was to 28 cents, mm. the exact same amount. I looked at that and I said, you know what? This is bigger than me. Mm. So let's back off a little bit here. Mm -hmm. You know, mm. someone's up, someone's watching after me. Yeah. I mean, I to have a new job, I had the pastor down the street banging on my door. We want you as our daycare director. We want you as our daycare director. Oh my gosh, a daycare director. I can't even control what I'm thinking. How am mm -hmm. I going to take care of 60 kids? And But guess what? It happened. And again, that was to me, God looking out for me. Mm -hmm. So I have so many of those that it just brought me back to my faith and it is stronger than ever. Oh, th thank, thank you heavens. for sharing that. Yes, God never right. promised that bad things were not going to happen to right. us, but he did promise that he'd walk with us through them and bring us through the outside or bring us through the other side better than we ever were. Mm. I do believe that. Yes. Um, Thank you for sharing that. Um, it, it is helpful to hear the personal, you know, the insight. And because you, I didn't realize that you had already been doing this work before your husband passed. So that testimony is really powerful. Oh, thank um, you. <laughs> one of the other questions has to do with um, just how we make sense of, you know, being triggered by something uh, more than a dozen years after the death of a person. Um, is there a particular way to, to cope with that? Um, well, we are, as anybody knows, it's been in our group, great proponents of journaling because journaling helps the mind in processing what we're going through. Um, and so, you know, triggers come when you least expect them. We cannot predict them but it's okay when they do happen and they're going to take us to that good old point of the pain. So again, it's okay to cry. Crying releases tears or tears release toxins that build up during grief. And so it's good to cry and get this out. Um, I mean, I have triggers happen to me all the time, mm. all the time. You can't prevent them. I would say in coping with them, I learned to breathe I learned to be still. I learned to listen to music. I learned to meditate. Um, and then sometimes I look at the trigger and I say, now what's this all about? Is there something I need to look at here? Hmm. So it's a real honest um, sort of dealing with it, a, a conversation with what the trigger is. So there okay. sounds like there, the openness and the willingness and you said you find, you suggest journaling often helps with that? Absolutely. Yeah. 
I, I never quite know if I'm writing to God or my husband or my mother or my sister. I just let it all out on mm. the paper mm -hmm. and um, it just gets it out, helps to get it out because, you know, it's really hard to admit sometimes, but like I have one sister left. Okay. And we don't have the, the closest of relationships, but I lost anybody to get mad at. I don't have oh, right. anybody that I can safely get angry with. <laughs> so that's mm -hmm. sort of something that is good to journal with. Or you can also find a good friend and say, could you be my container? Um, mm. I just need to vent a little bit. Um, but people that were close to us and know us, we could, you know, bounce things off of them and get angry if we needed to. Mm. Um, one of the things that um, we sometimes notice is that people don't want to talk. So you will call and you'd say, hi, you know, how are you? Well, how should I be? Right. I hate it when you ask me that question. Mm -hmm. um, is there a way that we can um, appropriately check in on loved ones without um, kind of piss, pissing them off, or really upsetting them? Because we you want to honor that as well. Correct. Um, oh, there, gosh, like my like when my sister calls the one that's living, she'll often say to me, um, "You know, I've learned so much from you about grief." Um, if, if, you know, my husband ever passes away, I'll know just what to do. And I'm like, I can't tell you what this does to me, but I'm just like, really? Mm -hmm. I would say again, don't ask people how they are. Okay. Yeah. Um, just say, what are you doing next week? Would you like to get together for a little lunch? Would you like to, as the weather gets better, maybe meet me at the park and we could just sit and and spend some time together. Um, is there something that you need help with? Could I help you with something? I had a lady come over, knock on my door, come in, and she unpacked all my dishes, washed them, and put them away in cupboards and cleaned out my cupboards. And I never asked her to, and she mm -hmm. never said a word to me. So sometimes what we do speaks louder than words. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. That's really helpful. Um, Friends, I I just want to I, I was fielding some of the questions that had been sent to me, but are there is there any um, other questions that have come up uh, for folks? That I you... saw one that said, "How many people attend the seminar?" Oh. Um, traditionally, when we met in person, um, we would get maybe seventy five to eighty people, and then after the first week, it would drop down. And, you know, the facilitators are like, what did I do? What did I say? But it's normal because people either aren't ready to, you mm. know, start talking and they thought maybe they were. And again, you don't even have to share. You can totally be quiet and listen when you come. Mm -hmm. um, and I would say the the fewest we've ever had would be maybe 30, something like that. But in the small groups, we try and not have... Um, any more than five people in a small group. So it just, honestly, we say that, you know, God decides who should be there. People will call and they'll find out about us through the strangest ways. Mm -hmm. And we just laugh about it, you know, mm -hmm. and then they're so glad that they came. So, and what, what are you say, would you say makes a, a good grief facilitator? Cause you have to cultivate those folks to help you. Is that right? Um, they come through the program and we keep our eyes open and it's called instinct. So sometimes I'll have somebody say to me, I want to be a facilitator because I want to help other people. Um, I would say the majority of our facilitators have been social workers, um, teachers. They 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 have that already innate ability to relate with people um, that is hard to teach someone. So it's someone who has the people skills and have, you know, has gone through their loss and they're able to share personally about their loss. I would say over the last 23 years, we've probably had maybe 50, 60 different facilitators. Mm, okay. Um, one of the one of the things that you said at the very beginning had to do with the physical kind of 
impact, the physical symptoms of grief. And I wondered if you could just go over that briefly. You mentioned um, how it kind of is incremental because of that sort of physicality. I think that would be helpful to know what we might expect at the very beginning and as time goes right. on. Okay, so then we actually have a paper which is, mm -hmm. has that all listed on it. It's called Reactions in the Normal Grief Experience. Um, changes in emotions, um, changes in your thought process, behavioral changes, um, interpersonal and social changes, and then physical complaints. So you could have hollowness, hollowness in the stomach, tightness in the chest is fairly common, um, tightness in the throat, oversensitivity to noise, I cannot tell you when people came back after the celebration, um, you know, for my husband, they were all in the manse and it was so loud and we, you can't take this. They're very sensitive because of the high adrenaline and cortisol. I just had to physically remove myself. Mm. So the, the, you know, oversensitivity to noise is very common. Um, breathlessness, weakness in the muscles, lack of energy, dry mouth. Um, as far as behaviors, and again, these are all subjects unto themselves, um, sleep disturbances, and I can tell you lots to help with that, um, appetite disturbances, absent-minded behavior, driving, and all of a sudden you are somewhere and you don't know how you got there. Mm. It's fairly common. Social withdrawal, of course, is very common and was compounded by COVID and the isolation. So that has produced a whole nother level of um, social withdrawal that we've worked with really hard. Um, people get disturbed about dreams, but I can explain about dreams and, and what we think about them. Avoiding reminders of the deceased um, some people cannot look at a picture. Some people can't stop looking at a picture. Again, we all grieve in our different way. Um, restlessness and overactivity. Again, adrenaline causes that. Crying and not to be judged. But there is also um, normal grief. And then there is grief that needs to be treated uh, along with depression and so forth. And I do address that in the seminar as well. I went through a clinical depression after my husband passed away and one in 2015, which was medicinally ca um, caused, but I do suffer from familial depression. So I can speak about it. And I tell you, this may sound very strange to you, but I thank God for those yeah. two clinical depressions I had because I understand, mm. I understand. And that's the beauty of what we come through is that we, we gain an understanding to help other people so that they can receive help. Um, I would, let's see, in feelings, anger, guilt, anxiety, fear, loneliness, fatigue, shock, yearning, um, relief, some people are like, oh, I'm so relieved. And you know, not everybody's going to say that, but if you have been a caregiver for a very long time, mm -hmm. um, it is a relief sometimes to have the person out of the pain that they were in and you feel relief. So then you feel guilty because you feel relieved and then you have to work through that guilt. Um, numbness, some people just feel numb for maybe five years. They mm, feel numb. Okay. Um, helplessness. Again, we have to learn as a griever, as a new person, how to trust ourselves, how to trust our instincts, how to make choices, how to make decisions. We are not helpless. And that's what we learn in Choices, Changes, Challenges. Does that help? Yes. Yes, I just um, I, I just thought it was interesting because you, you when you mentioned the adrenaline adrenaline and cortisol, I it it occurred to me that there's so much happening in our bodies that impact 
everything that we were, you know, I wasn't really aware of. And I, I think it's helpful to notice just for if we're grieving or if a loved one is grieving that, you know, there might be reactions that don't make sense. Oh, they, they don't seem like themselves, but because they, they absolutely. Don't, they Those people yeah. call and say, I, I don't feel like myself. And I said, oh, you're very normal. Mm -hmm. um, some people overeat, some people undereat. Um, I, again, was pretty severe. I was very functional, but I was pretty severe. Um, mm. I could only eat Burger King chicken, grilled chicken sandwiches. That was it. <laughs> so I yeah. drove up to Garwood and they saw me coming and they hung out the window and I picked oh, it up. Gave yeah. my money. So I said to my GI doctor, I can only eat Burger King grilled chicken sandwiches. And he said, that's okay. And I said, twice a day, that's it. I can't eat anything fresh. It will not digest. And he says, it's okay. It won't be forever. And that's a one-liner. It's very important mm -hmm. tool. This is not going to last forever because it feels like it. But I do not eat grilled chicken sandwiches from Burger King. No, no, you probably can't stand okay. them anymore. So was there just a moment, a point in time when you just noticed you weren't in the mood for that anymore? Did it, or was it gradual or was it sudden? Well, I have some GI issues as compromises myself. So um, I worked with a dietitian. Being a nurse, I'm always going to look for resources. Hmm. And she helped me learn to incorporate um, fiber into my diet so that I didn't have IBS. A lot of people with that come through um, grief do develop IBS. Mm -hmm. So I can speak to that one too, like, mm -hmm. you know? Um, and so we learn as, as a process of how to do this. It's just really all very, very individualized. Mm -hmm. And I was very fortunate to um, my children actually called a local psychiatrist who they knew that I knew as a colleague. And they're like, we're really worried about our mom. Could you talk to her? He still won't tell me to this day which one of them called. Oh, okay. <laughs> and, um, okay. Well, that's good. Oh, you know, I, uh, I went and got help, got on some medication. It did not take the pain away, but it certainly did help. So again, I'm always glad to talk to people about that. Well, thank you so much for your, your generosity. Um, friends, I appreciate your presence and hope that it has been helpful. As always, we have recorded um, this and it will be available in a few days on YouTube. Um, and I, if anybody would like to reach out to get more information, please feel free to reach out to me and um, we can put you together with Patty if that is something that would be helpful. Uh, it sounds like you're willing to be a resource to answer questions. Um, Absolutely. And we thank you. Thank so you. Friends, as we go from this place, it is always our wish that you be well. And we hope that you um, come back and visit us again another time. Thank you, Patty. Thank you so much. Namaste.